my suffering is not suffering. My suffering is a, a guidebook of how to overcome suffering, right? Because mm -hmm. my suffering has a meaning. I had to endure that so I could be here so that I could have this amazing, fulfilling, purpose-driven life of helping other people heal. I could not do that had I not gone through that. And this is the most intoxicating feeling in the world is when you help somebody overcome yes. something in their life. When I get a message from guys that are like, Sonny, do you have no idea how much you saved my life? I was going to off myself <laughs> and you mm. it, like it. It was worth it. I would live all of that trauma I went through twice. I'd go back through it two more times if I had to, to get to where I'm at, to get that message. Hey, I'm Megs and welcome to the Free To Be You podcast. I'm a life alignment coach passionate about helping women uncover who they really are so they can author a life they're obsessed with and move away from self-abandonment into full self-expression. This podcast is created with one purpose, to give you permission to finally free yourself up and be you in every area of your life. Before we hear from this incredible guest, I want to tell you about my free quiz. I've created it so that you can uncover the BS that you believe about yourself that stops you from showing up, feeling freed to be who you really are and stepping into the life that you deserve. The link for the quiz is in the show notes below this episode. So once you've finished listening to this incredible story, head over, take the quiz and uncover your inner mean girl once and for all. Following on from my conversation last week around self-forgiveness, I have an incredible guest for you today, Sonny Von Cleveland. He's a motivational speaker, coach, and author, passionate about sharing his history and experiences of sexual abuse and incarceration to aid in the healing of others. He's an ardent advocate for fearlessly and authentically owning one's story to rise and choose growth from adversity. It really needs no more introduction than that. You're going to be so inspired by hearing Sonny's story. So let's dive in and hear his incredible tale of not only how he had to forgive himself, but also those who wronged him. Sunny, welcome to the Freed to Be You podcast. I'm so pumped to have this conversation with you today because I know that you and I have had a previous conversation where I was on your show. So it's great to return the favor. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you, Megs. You are an inspirational woman and thank you so much for everything that you do. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. Well, I have to say you sound like a radio host, so you're already going to, you know, <laughs> blow the socks off of all my people that are listening. <laughs> so what I do want to ask you before we do anything else is who are you? A little bit about your story because we're going to go deep today, uh, but I think it would be good for us to have a little bit of an idea about what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Sonny Von Cleveland. I am a philanthropist at the end of the day, and I just learned that I'm a philanthropist. I didn't even realize <laughs> what that was. And that's what I am. Uh, I just started my nonprofit called the Von Cleveland Foundation uh, that is designed to distribute self-help mindset coaching and personal development materials to marginalized people and people that are incarcerated or previously incarcerated people, because those are the people that need it the most. Uh, and so that is just taken over my life. And it's, it's such an amazing thing. I'm also an author. I'm a photographer. I'm a cat cafe owner. I am a juvenile mentor. I go into juvenile facilities in Riverside County, California and mentor juveniles. I'm a re-entry coach with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in Los Angeles, counseling and mentoring guys that and girls that have just been released from incarceration. I'm a former musician, rap metal vocalist uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And prior to all of that, I spent 18 years in prison. I went to when I was 16 years old. Uh, I came from a small town in Michigan, and I grew up very abused. When I was five years old, I started being molested by my uncle and three other men over the course of the next five years would molest me pretty much on a weekly basis. Uh, when I was seven years old, I got convicted of a felony, which is unheard of, mm. uh, but I found something that I escaped into when that happened. When I was seven years old, I broke into a church with my brother. And we stole some pudding cups and some playing cards. And we were arrested and charged with a felony uh, for larceny from a building. And I was given 60 days probation. And when that happened, 
the men that were molesting me at the time went away. And mm. I, I, and then I, obviously they didn't want to be around a kid that's on probation and has probation officers and police around because of what they're doing to me. I imagine they were probably shaking in their boots thinking that, Oh no, this kid's going to talk, but I didn't because the threats that these men were making, I took as valid, right? Like my uncle would say, if you tell and tell anybody, I'm going to have to hurt you. I'm going to have to hurt your mom. I have to hurt the whole family. Uh, and so, and, and, and of course, every predator has the same line of threats. And so I didn't yeah. say anything. I got my whooping for breaking the law, uh, got my probation, and the men went away. And so in my little young mind, I was like, okay, I just found the key to protect myself. And so I went out and broke the law again. And then, boom, back on probation. I was like, well, this works, right? So I fell in love with the attention from police officers because these were men that didn't want to hurt me. They just wanted to help me. Mm. Uh, and going into courtrooms, I'm the center of attention uh, and everybody wants me to be a good kid and, and they're trying to help me and I don't have to tell on the perpetrators. And so in my young mind, I'm able to handle this. I can handle all this, this stress, this abuse that I'm going through. And I found my escape through music. I would go into the closets and I would regress to myself and, and just get lost in, in Harry Chapin and Jimmy Buffett and, and meatloaf and white snake. And my mom had an eclectic tape collection. Um, and that was my, my escape. And then when I started going to school, obviously I'm, I was a very extroverted kid. I'm a very extroverted person. Now I'm just freed to be me. So I can do that. That's why you're see, here. See what I did there. Yes, uh, I did. And so uh, I, I was a very extroverted kid. And when this abuse started happening, obviously I started to regress into myself because I had these regressive emotions and I became introverted. So my hygiene was very poor because I thought if I didn't take care of my hygiene, I would smell and they wouldn't want to touch me. You'd want to leave me alone. But that was a bullseye for bullies at school. Mm. And I start. I was bullied horribly starting in like first grade, uh, all the way through my entire school career. Like uh, when I got a little bit older, the older kids would, you know, pull my hair and punch me and, and beat me up on the bus and beat me up in the locker rooms and stuff me in lockers and just, it was a bad existence as a kid. Uh, but I somehow felt like I deserved all that, right? Like I felt like something, I felt dirty. I felt ashamed. I felt like I was just not a, a good human being and I, I deserved everything that was happening. Um, and so when I was 16 years old, I had stolen some money from my high school and the judge was just sick of it. He was like, you know what? I've given you chance after chance. I've never been taken away. I was never put in juvenile detention facilities. None of that. My brother was taken away when he was 12 and he's 19 months older than I am. And so I figured I was on that same path and that I would end up there, but I, I never did. And so when I stole this money from the school, I went in to court and he sent me to jail for six months. And I was, and this was my first time ever being taken away. I was like, oh no, well now what do I do? Yeah, And my mother came to visit and said, you know what? I'm taking off out of state. You're going to be here for six months. Me and my boyfriend are taking off out of state. And she left. And, and then all of a sudden, here comes all these other charges. Like, oh, well, you broke into this house. Well, you stole this. Well, you did that. Well, you did this. And so I had a, a, you know, a worthless attorney that came in and just wanted to clean up the docket and convinced me to plead guilty to all of this. And as I'm standing in the courtroom for sentencing, I think I'm going to go to boot camp. My judge tells, or my, my lawyer saying, yeah, they'll, they'll probably just send you to boot camp. You know, you're only 16. And he says, I'm committing you to the Michigan Department of Corrections for a term of 24 to 60 months. And I'm like, what does that mean to my lawyer? And he said, well, he just sent you to prison. I was like, like Shawshank Redemption prison? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He just sent you to prison. I'm like, well, what can't we do anything about that? Like, well, we'll put in an appeal. Like, yeah, okay. I know how appeals work. That that's nothing. And so here I go, uh, you know, 30 days later, as I'm sitting in a County jail, you know, you watch all these crazy movies on TV and you see all that. I'm like, I'm going there. Shit. <laughs> what? I don't know what to do. Uh, and then I was sent to quarantine 
And of course, everybody that's in jail just fills your head with all the horror stories of prison. Yeah. You know, you better join a gang, better get a knife, better learn how to fight, better get some tattoos, better toughen up, kid, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I'm this skinny, tall kid. I'm a six foot six with long hair and a buck 75, right? And uh, I I got sent to quarantine in Ionia, Michigan, and I was there for, uh, I don't know, four or five days, maybe three or four days. And it was the first time I had ever seen this many people off. I I come from an all white area. I've never seen this many black people, this many Mexican people. I've never seen gangbangers. I've never seen anything like this. And I mean, it's a freaking dungeon and you, I'm just like, holy shit. So I spent the first few days just kind of head down, staying to myself. And then I was going to, to dinner one day and, uh, my bunkie took off. I got down off my bunk and I was putting my shoes on. I bent down to put my shoes on when I stood up two dudes ran into the cell and one dude, he socked me in my face. I kind of fell backwards and, uh, and then they raped me and it was, it was brutal, right? Like they put a knife into my neck and I mean, they cut, I still got a little scar right here. They just stuck it right up in there and said, if you move, you're dead. And I, I just delayed and endured it. What was happening? Cause I didn't want to die. It was kind of a shock, you know, not really knowing what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and then, and the doors, they open automatically every five minutes, right? During child lines. And so I knew that it was about 15 minutes because the door opened and closed three times. And then when it, on the last one, they took off out of the cell. And so I just laid there trying to process what's going on. And this rage took over me, right? Like uh, I never, I've been a victim my whole life up to this point. And I thought I have to be here for another, however many years, I cannot let this happen again. And, and, and I'm used to being abused. So it wasn't, I mean, this was like the most traumatic abuse that I'd been through, but in the same sense, I was like, it was a little painful, but I mean, I've been being molested my whole life. Mm. So it wasn't like a, a traumatic shock and awe moment for me. I'm just like, well, this is what my life is. I'm done. I'm done. I stood up and I, I looked at my desk and there's a bunch of little segregation pencils. They're probably I don't know, four or five inches long. And I grabbed a handful of them up and I tied a shoestring around it. And I stood at the door. And when they come back from Chow, he's standing across there talking to his his other buddy and he's laughing. And I walked out of the cell when the door opened. I went over and nonchalantly like, hey, man, I just want to let you know, I'm not going to say anything about this. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, like you didn't know what you just did. And I unleashed and stabbed the hell out of him in his face. Mm, and, and everything just came out at once just raged out on him you know mm. 16 years of rage <laughs> and uh i didn't do a whole lot of damage they're small little pencils they didn't do a lot but their blood went everywhere like because i'm scratching his face with these pencils and there's holes and and he's screaming like a little girl and everybody else is standing around watching like oh man uh and then i ran back into my cell and i took the pencils off and I, dump water on them and boom, 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 threw them down real quick. And here come the police. They come running down the COs uh, and they grab him up and they're like, Oh man, what do I do? And they drag him away. And his buddy comes up, his little rapist friend comes running up and says, Oh man, you got to take me too. That guy's going to get me too. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm in some real shit and charted him off. And then my bunkie comes back, comes in the cell, the door closed. He's like, what the hell was that all about? He says, none of your business, man. He's like, yeah, no, none of my business. Got up on his bunk and they never came back. The COs never came back. Nothing ever happened. And then that started a really bad trajectory of my life. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, all the other inmates looked at me like I was a, like a gangster. Right? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to play into this. I'm going to play into this persona because uh, this is a way for me to, to protect myself. Uh, and that led to the next five years. I ended up maxing the whole sentence because I spent the next 45 years just gangbanging violence. When I got to the next facility, uh, a gang member came up and was, he was my bunkie and said, my boys want to put you down in the gang because we know you're about your business. And, uh, first thing I had to do was go stab another dude. And I got into stabbing people. And that was my source of not just protection, but I have felt empowered, right? Yeah. And yeah. And I 
put on mask after mask. I started getting all these tattoos on my neck and on my face and on my hands. And I wanted to get them in really prominent places where people could see them. So I looked tough and mean. And, and I, I delved into this, this character and I got lost in it. I became the monster that I was trying to protect myself from. And five years later, I was 21. They opened the doors, gave me $75 and three condoms and said, good luck. No parole, no probation, no oversight. Doors open, you're free to go. And I was so lost. I was a train wreck of a human being. I had no idea what to do. I was lost in this gangbanging character that I had formulated over these years. And I didn't know anything else. <laughs> I, yeah. went out, uh, I, went, I went out and I just, I was a, a stain on society for 20 months. I went all over the country. I got into big boy crimes, robbing drug dealers, and and I got two girls pregnant. Obviously, I didn't keep the condoms. Um, <laughs> and it was just, it was such a bad thing. I, I, I had this, this goal in my mind of being like the new Scarface or something. And it was just so, I took out all my anger on the world. I felt like karma had fucked me in the beginning. Excuse me. Can we? You can. My bad. Free to be okay. you. <laughs> that was my philosophy. It's an adjective in right. the right place. My philosophy in life was that karma fucked me first. Yeah. And so if something bad happens to you, it's because karma is coming to get you. And mm -hmm. I am the mechanism karma has sent. And mm -hmm. that was what I used for my justification for all the hurt and, and trauma that I caused to other people. Yeah. And so I got caught 20 months later. Uh, you know, breaking into houses and I had a theft ring and robbing people. And, and it was a pretty bad, I broke into the house of a pedophile and he came home and that did not end well. <laughs> and, and so I got 12 years again, they put me back in prison for 12 years. And this time I was like, something profound kind of switched there. And I was like, you know what? I have to be a better gangster. I got to be a smoother gangster. I have kids now. I got to be a dad. And in the oldest, the mother of my oldest child uh, had come back into my life and, and, you know, she was going to, I'm going to stand by you on this prison bit. We're going to do this. We're going to be a family. And she would bring my son up every week to come visit me. And I went right back into the gangs. As soon as I got back there, everybody's like, oh, there's Johnny. What's up, bro? What's up, bro? Right back into the same stuff. Except this time I was like, listen, I'm a veteran. I don't need to be mm -hmm. out here stabbing people. Like, I'm a dad now. Uh, if, if it's necessary. And sometimes it was. Uh, I'm there. I'll be the first one to, on the front lines messing everybody up. But other than that, I'm trying to be a dad. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow. I want to strengthen my mind. Right. And so I started reading all the wrong material. I started mm -hmm. reading the 48 laws of power, the prince by Machiavelli and the art of war by Sun Tzu and all these things that I thought were designed to teach you how to be a mentally strong human being. But all these things really are, are manipulation manuals that gangs use to learn how to be better criminals. Mm. And so I'm going down this path. And then in 2008, after being back about four years, I find out that my brother is having an affair with my oldest son's mother. And this is, the, you know, my brother from childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she is pregnant with his kid. And the last thing she says to me is he's going to raise your son as his own uh, and doesn't think you should call anymore. And hung up and I lost my shit. <laughs> understandably. I, I lost because that was all I had. And I, I came to the realization that there was no point in being a good person. There's just no point. What, what is the point? I'm just going to, I'm going to be me. And the problem was, was I thought that me was this gangster that was, yeah. you know, just a bad dude. And yeah. right around then uh, there was a pretty violent altercation. I landed in the hole for a, a long stretch. Um, and when I got to the hole, I, I mean, that was a very violent altercation and I'm in the hole and I'm washing blood and pepper spray off my face. And I hear this guy across the hole and he yells, Hey, white boy, come talk to me. And I spazzed out on Fuck you, man. Don't you, who are you talking to bro? You are talking to the wrong guy. My dude, I will stab the shit out of you. <laughs> I will kill you, bro. Do not talk to me. Oh, come on, white boy. What's wrong, man? Come talk to me, man. Uh -huh. And every day 
nonstop, you know, four or five times a day. Hey, quiet boy, why won't you talk to me, man? Come on, man. I just want to talk to you. Blah, 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 blah. We're lonely, right? We all we got. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not going to talk to you, bro. Shut up talking. And so the only time I'm saying anything to him is to cuss him out. And then about a week later, I get pulled out of the cell to go down and see SEC. And, you know, the guy that you, you messed up is in a really bad shape. And we're giving you 60 months in the hole. And so I was given this five-year sentence in the hole now. And I'm like, that sucks. The <laughs> hole is now. like solitude. Solid, solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. right? It's a nine by 10 cell with nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and the first thing I thought was funny. I, I was like, I got to listen to that asshole calling over there for five years. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to this dude. <laughs> Damn it. And so we go back to the cell. It's not 30 seconds after they took the cuffs off and closed the hat. Hey, why boy, what happened? Come on, man. Come talk to me. So I, I'm like, what, dude, what do you want to talk about? And he says, why are you so angry? Mm. What the hell kind of question is that? <laughs> what are you, a psychologist, dude? Because I'm in prison. My life sucks. You won't shut up. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why I'm angry. He says, no, no, no. That's why you're mad. Mad is on the surface. Anger is such a deeper emotion and you are an angry young man. And I'm like, how old were you at this point? Ah, uh, this was 2008. So I was 27, I think. Mm. And so I was like, shut up, man. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you, man. Shut up. I knew I didn't want to talk to you. And so I go back and I'm working out. I'm angry. I'm, I just got these five years in the hole. I'm pissed off. And, and at, I, now I'm thinking, why am I so angry? Why am I so angry? And, and I mean, I'm just, and I come to the realization that I've just been a victim my whole life. First, I was a victim of these perpetrators. And now I'm a victim of myself. Mm -hmm. And I hate myself. I, I hate who I am. I hate my life. I hate everything in it. And I just don't want to be here anymore. And so and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm either going to get up on the sink and I'm going to do a swan dive onto the cement floor and try to break my own neck. Or I'm going to go over here and tell this guy why I'm so angry. And so what did you do? Well, I'm still alive. <laughs> so I went to the door and I talked to him and and that's thus starts the journey of the of the metamorphosis of my life. Uh, this man became my mentor, and over the next nineteen months, he just completely helped me immerse myself in self forgiveness and emotional mm -hmm. uh, healing, and how to process emotion and trauma, and how to forgive myself, how to forgive others, how to find your purpose in life, how to find a meaning. And the whole time he's reminding mm. me that we're not friends. I don't like you. We're not friends. I'm a Moabite. You're white. I don't like you. And I'm like, well, why are you helping me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he'd been in prison for 30 years, right? He came into wow. prison in the 80s and he's doing natural life. He's never getting out. And through me, he found an avenue of maybe helping somebody. Yeah. And, he found some purpose himself. And, and he did. And, I turned that 60 months into 19. I was able to get that knocked down. I started writing essays. I started submitting things out to, you know, the, the prison contest. They would have written word contests and submitting essays. And uh, I even got to the point where they uh, allowed me to get books from the local library uh, through an, right. an inter intermutual contract. And uh, then they came in and brought a new program they were implementing in the Department of Corrections called Thinking for a Change, and they wanted inmates to teach it. And they came and they said, if we give you the materials, will you study it and tell us how you would teach this class? And I said, sure. So they gave it to me. Uh, and they said, okay, if you do this, we'll let you out of the hole. Hmm. Well, I'm in. Let me, let me do this. Uh, and they, once I mastered it, they, they came and they got me. We're going, you're going to go teach this class. And the, just the sickest joke. I thought it was the sickest joke. They took me to the protective custody unit. Instead, I, I thought they were going to release me out. They took me to protective mm. custody and protective custody is, is the worst of the worst, right? There's it primarily it's set up for people that are too afraid to be in general population. But the sad truth is that it's mostly child molesters, cops, judges, lawyers, people that can't be in general population because they'll get terrorized. Mm. 
Right. And so they put me over there and here's my class of 20 people. 17 of them are pedophiles. And three of them were not. And as soon as they said all announced all that, those three got up and left. So my whole class that I have to teach are all pedophiles. And wow. I thought to myself, this is the sickest joke in the world, right? Like I have to teach pedophiles how to think better. Mm. And so I, in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is a pivotal moment in my life. I can either refuse because I hate pedophiles or I can go back to my cell and, and go to serve out my time. Or I can teach these men what I've learned and, and, and help them to think better and maybe save a child somewhere. And that so I decided a, to yeah. use my life, my experiences mm -hmm. to show them what happens when you molest children, they become me, right? This is what happens to them. And mm. so I poured my soul into teaching this class and whether or not these men got it, I don't know, but they all graduated. Uh, and I served and I, I then had to leave the gang. Right. So I served, I know I got a few years left on my sentence. I'm a, in a different mindset. I know I'm a different person. This, this was a, a monumental change for me teaching this class. Mm -hmm. And, and then they let me out of the hole and I had to, to leave the gang. And that was, that did not go over well. I was stabbed twice. I was beat up daily. Gosh. Uh, I was, I got scars all over my fingers uh, because they locked me in the head in the chow hall one day and I had my hands up here and they were just hitting me with locks and it just, it was, did not go well. After about a year of enduring that, I, I finally, I took an oath of nonviolence and they really pushed me on this. And I'm like, okay, listen, if you touch me one more time, I'm going to break this oath of mine. <laughs> and of course they did. You can't scare anybody in prison. And so I had one more violent altercation and, and that was it. They left me alone. I spent the rest of my time mentoring people and, and building my plan for my future. Uh, and then I was released seven years ago. And now you know the rest of the story. Gosh, I couldn't interrupt you. I was like... <laughs> That is quite the journey and knowing now what you're doing with your podcast and your book, which I'm dying I to I promise read, you, you should way. still buy the book though. I know I um, just gave away the majority no, of it. No, no, no. buy the book because I go way 100%. more. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And the lessons that, uh, that are going to come from that are amazing. There's so much we could dig into. I think the biggest thing that's going to resonate that we could go further on here is overcoming that trauma and like forgiving yourself, like you said, like the emotional resilience that I'm, you would have built out of that. What has been the biggest, what's the biggest impact that you could say you it's had on you forgiving yourself? Like, Forgiving yourself for all those things, obviously, you know, taking that class, that would have been a pivotal moment. But to get to where you are now, I know from our conversations that you had to forgive yourself for a lot of the things that have happened. So what's the biggest impact that's had on your life? Um, it's allowed me to be free. I, I literally have no guilt. And when you have no guilt in your life, I don't look back with any shred of guilt because I've done all that I can do to atone for what I've done. And that's all I can do. And I've forgiven myself for what I've done. And when you, when you believe that you have made a significant change, a metamorphic metamorphical, I don't think that's a word when you've made a monumental change. All right. I said it, you knew what we meant. It's a word. Uh, <laughs> I, when you make that type of monumental leap forward in your life and you know that you've done the best you can and you, you say, I can't do anymore, but I will spend the rest of my life trying to be a beacon of hope for people. It, it just, it, the weight as, as I'm going through that process of forgiving and the, the method that I use, the methodology behind that was people that have done me wrong, my brother, the kid's mom, the, the, the pedophiles, the gangbangers, my, my own mother, my own father, 
all these people that have done me wrong, how would they want to be forgiven? Right? If they came to me and said, I'm so sorry for what I've done, would I be forgiving of them? Would I let them go? And then I got to thinking all the stuff. I read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is by far the most pivotal book in my life. I've read that class. Very powerful. That stuck book. out the most to me. It is a powerful book. The thing that stuck out the most to me was he said, suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it has a meaning. And that to me, I mean, I cried when I read that. I cried when I read that book. I still, it choked me up. Like I'm fighting him back right now, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's so profound. My suffering is not suffering. My suffering is a, a guidebook of how to overcome suffering, right? Because mm -hmm. my suffering has a meaning. I had to endure that so I could be here so that I could have this amazing, fulfilling, purpose-driven life of helping other people heal. I could not do that had I not gone through that. And this is the most intoxicating feeling in the world is when you help somebody overcome yes. something in their life. When I get a message from guys that are like, Sonny, get, you have no idea how much you saved my life. I was going to off myself <laughs> and you've mm. it, like, it's, it was worth it. I would live all of that trauma. I went through twice. I'd go back through it two more times if I had to, to get to where I'm at, to get that message. And it's so fulfilling. And I envisioned that because one of the most profound things that I've done, and you guys have to read the book for, to get these in-depth yeah. lessons that I went through, but writing my obituary was one of the most mm. profound things I've ever done in my life. And when you take that, that process seriously, you have a blueprint for the rest of your life of how you want your life to look out. You just got to follow it. It's copy and paste, right? Like I know what I want. And one of the things in there was I want to save people. I want to help people understand that you can endure so much more than you think you can. Yeah. And, and allow my suffering to be a blueprint for that so that you know that... If that guy can endure that, I can endure this. And Viktor Frankl was the beacon of hope for me in that because when I read what that man went through, you know, he had a beautiful family, he had a beautiful business, and Nazis kicked his door in, took him and his family, and took him to Auschwitz. And he's watching mm. his friends and his family be eradicated and experimented on and murdered and just tortured. And the whole time he's smiling, he's inspiring other people. When we can no longer control our environment, we have to control our attitude, right? When we, yeah. Or when we can't, when we can no longer change our environment, we have to change our attitude. And that made me feel so worthless <laughs> and at the same time so inspired because I used all the trauma I'd been through in my life as my excuse to hurt the world, to hurt everybody. And then I got to thinking like, I may have destroyed families just from breaking into homes, I may have destroyed a child's ability to trust in his parents to protect them. I may have destroyed a wife's ability to believe in her husband to be a protector of her family. I may have destroyed a guy's, his, his self-worth to think that he can protect his family, and, right? And these are things that you don't consider when you're, when you're committing the acts. You don't think about that, right? Mm. But these people had to come home to their, their home, trashed, ransacked, priceless things stolen. And I was like, I don't know how to make amends for that. I don't know mm. who I did it to. I don't know their names. How do I find this forgiveness from these people? And as badly as I wanted that forgiveness, I thought about what about the people that have done me wrong? What if they are thinking, God, I don't know where he's at. I don't know how to get a hold of him, but I wish he would forgive me. And as bad as I want those people that I've done wrong to forgive me, I'm assuming that the people that have done me wrong want that same level of forgiveness. And I give it to you for free. I give it to you freely. I'm, I'm, I let it go because I hope that they will forgive me. And mm. I'm hoping that God, Buddha, Allah, Odin, whatever you call him is taking that innate desire that I have to be forgiven and putting it on those people's hearts. My remorse is being put on their hearts. And I think that they know it. I believe in my heart of hearts that they know somewhere it's okay that guy feels bad for what he did mm. and and that was my pathway to self-forgiveness once I yeah. came to that realization I'm like okay I can let it go I felt like a weight being lifted off of my shoulders and I'm like oh, fuck I can breathe again <laughs> yeah like 
And now I'm seeing life through a whole new lens and I, I kindness and compassion and empathy. Like these are now my driving tools instead of pity. When I first started to do that, I wrote letters to these people. That was my mm-hmm. process was write mm-hmm. letters of apology. And I noticed when I first started writing that they're just filled with excuses, right? I want to apologize for what I did to you in your home. Uh, you know, I grew up in a horrible life. I was molested. I was hurt. I was raped, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking at it and I, I would send it over to Mallory, who's the Muslim guy. Like, and he'd be like, Doug, all you did was make excuses for everything you did. Is this the guy like, in the hall with you? The, yeah, briefly. the Muslim guy yeah. across the hall. Right. I mean, I sent him everything. And so he, yeah, he helped okay. me process it. And he would send it back like, bro, that's bullshit. You just made an excuse for everything. And I'm like, don't, bitch, don't say that to me, man. I just put my heart and soul in that. He's like, no, you didn't. You just made excuses and send it back. Do it again. Mm. All right, go back. But it worked, right? And when I got, you know, after I, I have 50 letters, to people that I don't know who they are and their heart felt I'm crying. I mean, I went into a depression. I couldn't mm. sleep. I couldn't eat. I, I mean, I look like a zombie. He was telling me, damn, why boy, you look like you're dying. Did you get AIDS over there or something? I'm like, ah, dude, like I can't sleep. I'm having nightmares. I wake up screaming and cold sweats and like, I'm not eating. And he's like, all right, man, you got one more day, one more day to feel sorry for yourself. <laughs> Let it go. And and so I would read these letters out loud. I would pace in my cell and I read these letters out loud to myself. And I would just put my emotion into it, just praying against everything that, that they're hearing my prayers, that whatever power is up there is putting this on their hearts. Mm-hmm. And, and then I flushed it down the toilet. And I'm telling you, it was just, it was just weight coming off my shoulders. Great. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my God, I can breathe. And, and it's, it was profound. It's powerful when you write things down, this is something that so much. I have a lot of um, belief in myself just from my own process, but also, you know, working with other people. I believe that when we make things tangible with language, then they're easier to process and we can be a lot more intentional about what we do next. And you, you and I've had a, a discussion around, you know, being making choices and the impact that they can have, but I don't feel like we can make any kind of choice to be to be different or to be free or to move forward without first letting go of what's in the way or getting out of our own way. And it sounds like that was so profound because you can read your words back. You can read your words back and you can see where the truth is and where the truth isn't. Right. And when you have that self-awareness to know that, okay, I'm bullshitting right here. I'm just making an excuse. You can eliminate that. Now I have to reword it and take the excuse away. Yeah. And I mean, how interesting and fortunate that you had this guy, you know. I was open to it. Yeah, you were open to it, but just the fact that he was there at that time for you. And I think we all have those, you know, those moments in our life where I guess everything comes to a head and you've got to make a, you know, a choice to to go one way or the other. And it's in that transformation. bottom. Rock bottom for sure. And it's not, everyone's rock bottom is relative, right? Like yours is, is intense and profound and, you know, I mean, one of the most, I don't even have a word, but it's, it's a, it's, I've heard a lot of stories in my years and I've heard a lot of people's, um, you know, childhood stories, you name it, and yours is definitely up there and it's not even all detail. So I'm looking forward to reading your book. What I love about the fact that you're here talking to me is that it hasn't all been for nothing. You are who you are and you're freed now to do something with that and you're choosing to do that, you're intentional about that and now all all of that actually means something to you and now to the world and to the people that you help. So I just want to, you know, really reiterate that because that's why I do what I do is helping people transform those transitions in their life, you know, rediscover the things that are true and let go of the things that aren't true. And you are a prime example of somebody who's done that already. So that's why I was like really excited to have you on the show. And I'm sure for those that are listening now can hear why I was so, you know, 
you know, quiet the while you were sharing. I, I learned <laughs> from that is that it's a choice. Right? Yes. And that's, that is what I have, that, that is the banner that I carry, right? Mm -hmm. My podcast, the choice effect, my primary teaching manuals, the choice effect, everything is choice, right? Yeah. It's you get to choose, right? And we, we get to choose every single moment of our life, every single day, what we do. We don't get to choose if we're victimized, right? You don't get to choose if somebody comes up and robs you, but you get to choose the way you respond to it. You get to choose mm -hmm. how you feel about it. You get to choose the anger you hold, and you also get to choose the anger you release. And our voice is our mechanism for healing. And that's the one thing you have to speak. You have to talk. We're the mm -hmm. only species that has this thing that allows us to communicate verbally our emotion and our intentions and our desires mm -hmm. and our pain. And, and this is the tool. Right. It was, it's very hard to talk about being victimized when you're first victimized. It's hard, mm. right? It's painful. It's shameful. It's hurtful. And some people can't get past that point. It's not that yes. they can't, it's won't. Can't mean yes. won't always. Mm. And when they learn to, when you learn to just have the bravery and the courage to speak what's happened to you, not complaining, don't complain mm. about it because that's a different ballgame. Oh, this and this happened to me. When you talk about it, this is what I endured. This is what I learned. This is the lessons that I've learned from this. And this is why I carry this trauma. And you say it again, tell somebody else, tell somebody else, tell somebody else. And it sucks. It hurts. It sucks. You feel ashamed. You feel dirty. You feel worthless. And the more you do it, the less it sucks. And, the, and then after a thousand times, it's like, yeah, so I was raped. I was molested. I was, and yeah, it, you can talk about it like that. Mm. Right. And that's called healing. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people and yourself included can't do that work alone. You had somebody there who was, Facts. you know, helping you through that. Right. So I feel like the, the first choice that people need to make is to find that avenue or that person or that program or whatever it is that's going to help them over that first hurdle. And that's the biggest choice of all and possibly the hardest because and, and we is. do have to look in the mirror and we do have to make a new choice to, to respond to these things differently, see them differently, be, have the willingness to let go of uh, what you know and uncover what you don't know about that yet. And, and that can be really, really scary for people. And I think too, sure. Sunny, the other thing that obviously allows us to make better choices is understanding more about ourselves, like having a sure. deep understanding of, the way that you go about things and why you go about things that way. What, like you said earlier, why you're angry, where is that coming from? You can't let go of anything until you have that kind of awareness. Would you agree? I'm 100%. Yeah. And you have to work through it. But, but the caveat to having, you don't have to have somebody anymore. In mm. the age of technology, you can do this work yourself. What you said, looking in the mirror, is such a profound thing. Most people that are dealing with trauma or some kind of pain that they're they, that they've have, have stuffed down and haven't dealt with can't even look in the mirror and talk to themselves. Mm. Right? So if you're listening to this and you're in a position where you're harboring some some pain or some trauma, sit down, pull out your phone. Everybody has one. Pop your your phone on, record, and start talking to yourself. Start telling yourself the truth, and then listen back. And when you listen back, pinpoint every moment you're full of shit. Be like, yeah, nope, I ducked it right there. I've just full of shit. And just keep doing it. You can do this work on yourself. If you have a computer and a camera, sit down and record yourself talking to yourself and then go back and analyze yourself and call yourself out on your bullshit. And be like, no, no, that was yep. an excuse. Go back and, and take it out. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get just talking to yourself. And then have the courage to branch out and talk to somebody. Right? Yes. Start a podcast, start talking to people, do videos on YouTube, whatever it takes, start telling your story and you'll start healing yourself. Mm. And that's the most important thing in life is to heal yourself because this is your life. You, you are worthy. You have value. You get to experience this lifetime and you deserve to be happy. You deserve to live your happiest life. So cleanse yes. yourself of all the bullshit and be happy. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I like to say, you know, that it's, it's not a dress rehearsal. <laughs> we right. don't get a dress no, rehearsal. In, 
You're we in the show. One show. show. <laughs> this is it, right? So if we don't see things that way, it's so easy to just let things play out, leave them as they are, not address things. And time is going to pass anyway. Life is well, going to pass well, anyway. People get comfortable with pain that they can tolerate, with with pain that they're well, aware of. Well, this is of, the no. Right? Exactly, yeah. Right. The familiar pain people mm-hmm. can tolerate. You know, a, a, a guy that hates his job, right? And hate is pain, right? When you mm. detest the job that you have, that's pain that you're harboring. Ah, oh, I got to go to this job. Blah, blah, blah. And you hate it, right? Mm-hmm. Why not quit and go do something else? You can, here's a, a news flash. You can yeah. fail at something you hate doing. So yes. why not fail at something you like doing, right? Mm-hmm. Go d- d- find out what you're passionate about and go try it. Go do it. Learn to monetize it. Take chances. Take risks. Fail forward. Fail forward. All yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to. Like, I mean, you right. don't actually, you don't have to. That's you don't have, you don't have to. It's a choice. Right? But if you, you want to be go free, it. if you want to feel right. freed to to live the life you want, have a life that you are obsessed with, as I like to say, it you have to make that choice to do that. Right. Otherwise, it's as not going to change. You know, you will get comfortable in in that pain that you're that, that's familiar, and you'll stay in a relationship for years that you don't yeah. want to be in, and you'll just stuff it down because it's like, yeah, but there's because the unknown is so scary, right? Yeah. And you're like, but if I leave what if you leave you're still going to be alive you're still going to be here you're still going to yeah. have feelings you're still going to have to use the bathroom you still got to eat still got to sleep nothing's really going to change except you're mm. going to be a little bit happier because you're not in that relationship anymore and yeah. some people it takes 28 years yeah All right <laughs> for sure for sure and that's just one example you're another there's Facts. countless others it took me a long time yeah Countless other examples years. that we could, uh, you know, well, you had a, rel- an, a relationship with yourself that you had to work through and let go of, right? Sure. So and then you had to you've rediscover done the work, that. It's a daily practice because just because mm. you've done the work doesn't mean that you're somehow immune or you're in, mm. you're infallible or that you're you're not capable. Because even after getting out of prison, what? In the state that I was in, I came out, I was iron-minded. I knew what I wanted and knew what I was going to do. And I allowed life to inundate me. And Mm -hmm. I got into a relationship for almost five years with a woman I couldn't stand being with. And and I allowed it to happen. I allowed it to happen because I made excuses. We have this beautiful son. This is my chance to be a father again, you know, and and I have a a nice home. I have a nice job and, and I want to be here. I'm a rock star, blah, 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 blah. And, and yet I'm miserable in this, this relationship. And I stayed Mm -hmm. and like, I chose that. That was my decision. I didn't have to. And yet I did until I woke up that morning, like, you know what? I'm done. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm done. I'm not accepting it. If that's the way the chips are going to fall, let them fall that way because I'm going to be happy regardless of what. And here we are, you know, two well, and a half years later. I would love to fast forward to the, to the well, not fast forward, but full circle now, I should say, because uh, this has been an amazing conversation. And I know that there is a happy ending and that sure. you are in a beautiful relationship now. So talk Very to us a little bit about that because that's quite uh you know let's say this seven years is not a long time to turn your life around from what you've just described it right. really isn't it's it's incredible so i know the 360s over yeah, the seven years i bet i bet so the latest one uh where you are now in a, a very happy marriage talk to me a little bit about this woman what made her different and how has that transition been for you sort of coming into relating to another human being in a healthy way? So I was married when I was right before I got out of prison, I met a woman and uh, we got married while I was locked up and I had never really had profound connection with anybody. And when I got out, I realized almost immediately that this was not, this is not my forever person, right? Like you, she wanted to go to work, come home, cook, 
sit down, watch movies, eat dinner, go to sleep, rinse and repeat. And I'm like, listen, lady, <laughs> I've been sitting on my ass for 18 years. I don't want to do that. Right. Like I, yeah. I've got goals and dreams and things I want to do. And, and we just, we, we had a, a relatively amicable divorce. Um, and we, we remained friends and that was nice. Uh, but then I met, I, I never seen, I've never dated. I never, uh, I got introduced to online dating on this, on these apps, what plenty of fish. And I'm like, <laughs> is this how people do this now? What, what's, but I met this girl and, and, and this is my, I've never encountered narcissism in my life. Um, and love bombing is a tool of narcissists. And so this girl love bombed me and I, I fell into it and I was intoxicated. Next thing you know, she's pregnant. And I'm like, Oh my God. And it took a while. I, again, I was in the music industry and did really well. Um, and then COVID hit and I couldn't do music, obviously, and couldn't do the job that I had had. Uh, so I started a YouTube channel doing music reactions and I did really well. And within a few months, I had a global fan base. I was up 30, 40,000 subs, in a relatively short time, making great money off of YouTube. Uh, and I started podcasting. I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to help people. I want to put out positive stuff. The world's full of shit and I want to put mm. out positive things. So I started a podcast called The Morning Brew and we did it every morning from 9 to 11 a.m., five days a week, such a commitment. And I had two other co-hosts. And one of my co-hosts was like, we well, should jump into Reiki. And I'm like, I don't believe in that whole hoopy boopy mumbo jumbo stuff, man. I'm a, I'm a person of, of action, right? I got to see it. <laughs> and he was like, well, then just try it. You got nothing to lose. I'll set you up with my Reiki master and go for it. And I'm like, fine, I'll bring the cameras and we'll do a segment on Reiki. And so I go to have this Reiki session and I forgot the camera. I'm like, well, all right, well, I'll just go through it anyway. And another mind changing life event. Right? She pulled out that you are miserable. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I got a great life. What are you talking about? She's like, yeah, but you're miserable in your relationship. I'm like, how do, you, how do you know that? What? Wait a minute. Hold up. <laughs> and she's like, you're carrying all this weight and this stress and blah, blah, blah. And that day I went home and left her. And I went home and just said, I'm done. I'm, I'm not happy and I'm leaving. And she went nuclear. <laughs> like nuclear and 48 hours later i was homeless i had no car she destroyed it i had no possessions she destroyed all everything that i owned i couldn't get in the house nothing and so i'm standing with nothing and i'm like okay so now what i don't know what to do <laughs> there's when covid this? Can't. oh this in was, covid yeah this was december of 2020 yeah wow. <laughs> december of 2020 nothing. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I can't get a job. It's COVID. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to show people how you fall down and get back up. I'm going to, I'm going to lead my life with love and kindness and compassion. And I will show you how to do this. You just don't quit. You just don't give up. You have mm. a choice. And so I did, I started grinding and grinding and still putting out positivity and uh, I had a booking agent at the time who booked me on podcasts uh, to yeah. tell my story. And he come to me, he said, I got this, uh, this amazing podcast. I met this girl in England. It's got this podcast named boot camp for the mind and soul. I think you'd be great on it. I said, all right, I'll book it. And so she booked here. He booked a pre-screen for me and at the pre-screen, it was chaos, right? I got my son because I had, I had gotten to a point where we were somewhat amicable. I had gotten a new condo, started to rebuild everything, got a new computer, started building things back up. I'm showing people how you get up. And my son, when the, when the pre-screen comes on, here's this blonde chick that's sitting on the screen like, hi. I was like, hi, hang on. Phone's going crazy. My other phone's going crazy. My buddy's over here trying to talk to me. I'm like, dude, shut up. And I got two cats over here that are just going nuts. And this little boy's running around. Ah! I'm like, God. and I, I hijacked her, her thing. Cause the connection was bad. I'm like, I can't, I don't know. Can I just send you a stream yard link and you can jump in over there and it'll go much smoother that way. And she's like, okay, <laughs> send her a stream yard link. She pops in over there. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like life is chaotic right now. Blah, 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 blah. And she's like, are you sure you want to be on the podcast? I'm like, I do. I do. I will be there. I promise you I'll be there. I'll be there on time. I'm much more professional than what what's looking. It's just really chaotic right now. And then that was it. 
boom, she got off. And a week later, now my podcast comes and I'm a very professional guy when it comes to these things. So I'm, yes. I'm early, I'm 15 minutes early. Uh, I'm shaved up, dressed nice, looking well, boom, on time. And she pops on the screen again. Boom. Here we go. Hello from London. And I'm like, I just realized in my mind, I didn't say it, but you are the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and an hour and some change later, I fell in love with this woman. Like we wow. had the most raw, authentic conversation I've ever had in my life. And she had tells you now, like I fell in love with you 20 minutes into that. <laughs> like every day after that, we talked every single day. We would phone each other. She was going through a horrible divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just, we bonded in that moment. We were, I felt seen, I felt heard. Like you, you knew everything that, I mean, I just gave her my life raw. You know, I was like, I don't, I don't even give a shit. Here it is. This is my life. <laughs> and she accepted me. And, yep. and I don't, I just, it was it. We talked every day for three or four months, six, seven hours a day. And I didn't know how I even had the time for that. Right. Like, and I look back at my life, my life was chaotic. I was doing stuff all hours of the day, every day, working a job doing tons of podcasting and, and videos and uploading. And, and now all of a sudden I just got six, seven hours a day to talk to this girl. I'm blowing well, everything talk. off. Like, yeah, I'm <laughs> blowing everything off. Like, yeah, I got a show. I don't care. I got this. I don't care. I'm a, and that was it. Like three or four months later, you know, she was like, I'm coming to America. Let's, let's, let's go. And I said, okay. And I, she was like, she helped me to see that I really needed to get out of Ohio where I was at, because at the, by this point, my ex, was just going nuts. I mean, she's got people breaking into my house, destroying my bike, wow. destroying my truck, just, and I knew like, this is going to end up with me either dead or in prison. Yes. And neither of those are an option. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to give her space. And then I'll try to just rekindle, uh, you know, reconnect with her and, and be a father to my son. I'm just going to give her some space and, and time will help. And it sure as hell hasn't because here we are two and a half years later and she's, we're not even going to get into that. Um, <laughs> but I left and as I headed West, I just felt the layers of stress and all that just peeling back mm -hmm. off. me. I gave my condo to this young kid who was homeless and he was working hard. And I just gave him the whole condo. I'm like, just have it, bro. Here's a shot at life. And I packed up my cats and got on my motorcycle and started heading down you the road. You took your cats sure, on the motorcycle? No, no, no. I left okay, I was going to say. I left my <laughs> cats with this kid. I was like, and this was another profound moment, right? This almost broke me. I left my cats with this kid. Like, you can have the condo, just watch the cats in my car and the stuff that's in it. I'm going to take my bike. I'm going to go out west. I'll fly back and get the car and the cats. And I got down to Cincinnati. And the next day, or that night, it was like midnight. I'm on the highway. And out of nowhere, there's a cutoff. And I'm like, shit. I go to get off and I crashed my bike and rolled off, rolled down the side of the road, bikes, and, and I'm laying there. And I just remember looking up at this guy like, I just can't catch a break. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I remember in that moment, like, this is a sign. This is a sign that I need to commit to this decision because I've left things here that are going to pull mm. me back and I'm going to end up coming back. To hell with this. I made a phone call. I gave the bike to my buddy. It wasn't really messed up, a little dent in the front end, but you can have the motorcycle. My ex-wife <laughs> came and got me, took me back to Ohio, got my car, grabbed my cats and said, to hell with this, I'm out. And I drove my car. And then the layers as I'm leaving, just layers are peeling off. Uh, and then I called her and she's like, let's, let's go to Palm Springs. And I picked her up at the airport on June 6th, 2021. And we have had one hell of a road. It's been nuts, but we're here and we're happier than ever. And we own businesses Amazing. and we help our community. We, it's, it's just such a fulfilling life. I'm and you know what, like, best. yeah, you are, you are an example of it. Again, I wanted to, to jump in and ask you something about 10 minutes ago, but I was like, I can't, I can't interrupt this. <laughs> it's like the second half of the story has got to be played out here. But one of the things that stands out to me is the fact that you, similar to my story, as you know, I've, I've told you mine before, showed up 
and both of you were in a situation where you were authentic, you were free to be you, you gave her everything, and she got to meet that version of you. Yeah. And so when someone falls in love with that version of you, the real version, the version that's true with no holes, bars, nothing in the way, and they love you, then it's a what more connection. could you ask? What more could you ask for? That's and the ultimate. There's so many I signs, right, that that pop out into, into for yeah. us that it's like, it's um it's like it's 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 crazy like we were we were camping and i mean we've done so much to, we've have trek we have conversations a year and a half into our relationship we're in such a in-depth conversation in the car that we drove past the grand canyon and missed it <laughs> oh wow <laughs> the that's goal sorry. was the goal was to go to the grand canyon we're going to go see the grand canyon neither of us have ever seen it let's go to the grand canyon and we're so engaged in this conversation we drove right past the biggest freaking hole in the earth and didn't see it wow it, and i'm like was that the grand canyon back there and she's like oh my god we had to turn around go all the way back and then come back to see like how do you miss the grand canyon we, we did uh, we've Do just it. done so many things and the crazy so part, connected. we went outside one night that really stands out to me. We were in San Simeon on the coast of California. And we went outside and we looked up and we're like, oh, look, look at that little cluster of stars. And we both seen it. And like that little cluster of stars, I think, because I call her my star seed, right? We come from the same star, I believe. Mm. And we look up, I'm like, I wonder what that is, that cluster of stars. And I, so I grab my phone, I pull out the compass and I look and it's at 222, 222 degrees. I'm like, that's weird. I'm like, hmm, 222. That's our number because that's our little star patch, right? So we went in yeah. back into the hotel room and started to look this up. The star patch is the Pleiades, right? And the Pleiades, it's a famous little star cluster. And I'm like, oh, we came from the Pleiades, 222. It's at 222. It's not at 222 degrees. I don't know why it was there. But then we looked up 222. And that is the symbol for twin flames. It's the number for mm. twin flames. And like, wow. what? That's weird. Now we have 222 uh, tattoos and, and 222 is our thing. February 22nd, just all kinds of 222s have lined up for us. And it's like, what? It's, <laughs> it's I had so, that. such an it's amazing funny. Feeling. I had a similar experience to that just on the weekend. I went, like, I hadn't looked at my phone for hours. Um, and I was away with Luke and I went to my phone and picked it up. And it was Saturday the 2nd. So on my phone, I have like little widgets on there. So there's Saturday the 2nd. 22 degrees this is the weather and it was uh -oh. 2 22 in uh -oh. the afternoon so how that's funny. so crazy and i remember right? thinking like that has to mean something i, I tend it to does. see ones everywhere like double ones that's, triple ones just happened ones. to me i have looked that up i have looked that and up. i looked this cool. up and you know what i have the picture right here on my phone i'm going to send it to you so you know i'm not lying <laughs> i sent it to my wife we looked this up and it said if you're seeing ones a lot it means you're doing the right thing. It means you're mm -hmm. on the right path, especially if you're seeing a left. And so I'm driving down Highway 111, which is right here that runs right through Palm Springs, 111. I look down, it's 111 degrees at 11, 11 a.m. I took a picture of it and sent it to my wife, said, I must be doing the right shit. I'm going to send you that <laughs> picture. So, you know, 111 degrees that. on Highway 111 at 11, 11. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> Doing the, right, doing the right thing in life and it's such a good feeling right like, it is it's such a it happy is. life and this is the and life everybody should be living you deserve 100%. this yeah took right. the words right out of my mouth i think that that's what we want people to get out of this conversation collectively between the two of us is that you you're never you don't have to be a victim of your circumstances you get that's to choose choice. you know you get to choose how you respond to them you get to create something different and we are a product of our choices and how we respond to the things that happen to us. I think that your story is incredible and I feel blessed that you've shared it with us today. So thank you very, very much. And I believe that I just a conversation with your wife is on the oh, cards because she sounds like an amazing woman and someone that I could she definitely a um, phenomenal, get the phenomenal other side story. of this story as well would be quite cool. So we have to set that up, but thank you for being on the show today. And okay. where can people get in touch with you uh, if they want to learn, well, buy your book first of all, and learn first, a little bit right. about 
Buy what the book. you are doing. The book is called <laughs> Hey White Boy, Conversations of Redemption. It's available on Amazon.com. Just go in there yeah. and pump in Hey White Boy. Um, but you can also go to heywhiteboy.com uh, and order the book from there. Um, and if you, you could just Google Sonny Von Cleveland and you find that everywhere. And uh, my link tree is probably the easiest way to find okay. everything. You can find Amazing. me Sonny Von Cleveland everywhere. If you just put that in, I'm going to pop up and you'll find it. I will put those links in the show notes at the bottom of the episode. And again, I just want to say for those that are listening, if this hasn't inspired you to take a really good look at where you're at and make a new choice, I'm not sure what will, but I do have to be. Uh huh. Decide where you want to be. I have some more amazing guests coming up on the show. But this is one that I was really excited to bring to you. So again, thanks, Sunny. And I look forward to our next guest next week. Until then, go out, choose you, and live the life you want. <laughs>